Oh, what an exciting hope that is all of ours who are in Christ Jesus, that the death is not the end. The grave will not have the final word. Jesus Christ rose again on the third day, declaring that we who are in Christ shall live also. Amen, amen. Oh, so good to have you here. God bless you. Look great today. Happy Easter. We welcome online campus. Good to have you watching as well today. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. What a joy. What an exciting day to be in the house. Lord, every day is exciting, but it's just kind of really sweet today, Easter Sunday morning. I, uh, we began a series actually uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Jason preached the last couple of weeks. Someone said, have you gone? Have you left it? No, I'm, I'm still around. I took a little vacation time, but he started a series on the I Am the names of God, the I am God. And it goes all the way back to the story of, of Moses and you have him by the burning bush and, and the glory of God comes down and the bush is on fire and a voice speaks out from that bush. And he says, I've seen the affliction of my people. Lead them out, lead them into freedom. Get them out of Egypt. And, 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 and Moses asks a fair question. He says, who shall I say is sending me? And the voice comes back, I am. And Moses said, no, that's, I, I yeah, but what's your name? I, I need a name. Give me a name that I can give to them. And he says, I am is sending you. And, and, and Moses says, wait a minute, time out. I, I need your name. I'm gonna tell these guys something. He says, I am that I am. And, and that word for I am in the Hebrew, they, they, they had, didn't have all the consonants like we have today, uh, or the vowels, excuse me, they just have consonants. So we don't know how it's pronounced. And so some people say Yahweh, you maybe have heard the term Jehovah, but Yahweh is probably closer. And it was such a sacred name for that covenant relationship that God had with the people of God, the children of Israel. Now, what'll happen is, John is, of, of all the gospel writers, the only one that includes these I am statements is John when he writes his gospel. Because what's he doing? John is out to prove that Jesus Christ is totally divine, that he is the son of God, that he is deity. And so he's the one who records these statements. And he records seven I am statements in the book of John. You heard the first one, I am the bread of life. Just like God gave the children of Israel manna in the wilderness, I am that sustenance, I am that bread of life. Last week you learned that I am the light of the world and he talked about I am the light. He's gonna talk about I am the good shepherd, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the door. Before Abraham was, I am. And today we're gonna look at the fifth time he uses the phrase I am and it's found in John 11 and he says I am the resurrection and the life. Today, we celebrate he, Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Now, before we look at our text together, uh, let me just kind of ask you guys a question. And let's just be honest this morning. No, no one's gonna, uh, they're not. Ha have you ever been frustrated with God? Let me see your hand. I, I have, I have. Uh, don't worry about getting struck dead or whatever. You raise your hand, it's okay. I, I think there's those times when we get frustrated. We say, God, where are you? How come I can't hear you? How, how, do you even see what's going on in my life? Do you, do you see what's happening all around me? And, and we have those moments when we pray and we think we're praying according to the will of our Heavenly Father and we're praying for other people, but the answer doesn't seem to come and we say, God, where are you? Or we want God to answer our prayer in a certain way and we say, God, I need a miracle, but I need it pretty quick and things are getting worse, or not getting better and, and, and he doesn't do it in the time we think he ought to and so that kind of, can be frustrating and it's, and it's really frustrating if you're like me to see bad people prospering and doing great and just flying through life and sometimes good people go through heartache and suffering and trials and tests. Now, if, if that's kind of been your story, <coughs> excuse me, at different times along the way, you can take comfort in two sisters. Their names are Martha and Mary. And they're experiencing the same frustration we have felt on many different levels before. And what has happened is their brother Lazarus has gotten sick and they send word to Jesus and they, Jesus, if you'll get here in a hurry, where are you at? The one you love is about to die. And then we see those words, he delayed his coming two more days. How do we handle the silence of God? How do we handle the delays of God? How do we handle those times in our life? Let's stand together. Let's look at our text this morning and we'll see he, him who is the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11 and verse number one. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You talk about a pull on somebody's heart. The one you love is sick, Lazarus. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. Look at those powerful words. No, it is for the God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let us pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are indeed the resurrection and the life. Thank you that we can know you. Thank you for your presence this morning. And I pray, God, you'll touch the hearts of each person in the house today. And we'll give you all the praise and the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to someone and say, you look amazing today in your Easter outfit. Now turn to your second choice and say, you don't look quite as good, but good to see you anyway. There's a few things that just jump out at this story right away as we dig into it. The first is simply this, that Jesus loved. He loved Mary, Martha, Lazarus. It says it in verse three, the one you love is sick. Aren't you gonna get here in a hurry? And and then it says in verse five again. And I think John's trying to build this case that, that even in spite of the sickness of Lazarus, even in spite of his death that would occur, even in spite of all this, nothing can stop the love of God. There's nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He will keep on loving no matter what's going on, no matter what's happening in our life. God is a God of love. Now, here's the deal about love. Love always produces action. And so eventually Jesus Christ would go to Judea because he loved. That that song we opened up with, for God so loved the world that he gave. Listen, the reason he came to this earth in the first place is because he loved the whole world. He loved all of us. He loved you wherever you're at and whatever you're going through. God loves you. And why, how did he show his love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that son would give his life on Calvary and die in our place that we might have everlasting life. God loves us that much. And then he says, God loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And I want to tell you, whatever your grief may be, whatever your pain may be, whatever you're experiencing now, It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means that sometimes God will allow allow the pain and the suffering to come our way. For God so loved the world. He he, he declares in verses three and five, I love Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And then it it seems in our own mind in the natural like a contradiction, but but he stayed two more days. If you really loved us, Jesus, why would you allow Lazarus to suffer any more than he needed to? Why'd you allow him to be sick two more days? Why could you have not got here on time? You see, the challenge for us is love allows the pain. Mary and Martha, they're, they're, they're by the bedside of Lazarus and they're trying chicken soup and they brought doctors in and they're trying every cure imaginable and there's hope within them. They, they think this, just maybe as long as there's some breath in Lazarus, if Jesus can just get there, he'll be okay. But the Lord delayed two more days. By the time the messenger returns and the messenger comes back and says, Jesus said this sickness will not end in death and already there's a contradiction because Lazarus had already died and they think to themselves, what in the world is Jesus talking about? In fact, he didn't make it while he was sick and he couldn't even make it in time for the burial. Where is he? The fact that he loves us and we love him is no guarantee we'll be sheltered from the problems and pain of life. It will come to every single one of us at some time or another in our life. In fact, the Father loved the Son, Jesus Christ, more than any you could ever imagine. And yet he allowed the Son to drink of the cup of the suffering. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Lord, if it's possible, if there's any way out of this, if I could go any other way but through the cross, if there's any other way besides carrying the sins of the entire world, please let this cup of suffering pass from me. And yet he would still go to the cross for us. He still loved Jesus every step of the way, but I will tell you, he loved us so much that he allowed his only begotten son to be sacrificed 
take our place. God loves us so, so much. He loved the Son. It was the pain that would allow Mary and Martha to see ultimately the glory of God, to experience the resurrection and the life for themselves. And I wanna tell you today, you may feel like you might be in some kind of a dark place today, but I'm here to declare again, Jesus loves you. You and you and you and you and every single one of us, God loves us so very, very much. There is nothing ever that can change the love of God. You can no more stop the love of God than stop the sun from shining. Can't do it. He loves both believers and unbelievers. He loves those who are well and he loves those who are sick. He loves those in any state of life they may go through. He loves every single person on the face of this earth. Now the tragedy is some people will take an umbrella to keep the sun from shining on them and there are some that choose not to respond to the love of God and not to receive his love, but it doesn't mean God does not love you. He loves you and that declaration went out. He loved, he loves, he loves. Love's delays can be hard to bear or understand. But the bottom line is Martha and Mary were looking for a healing. And isn't that what we do? We want a healing, we want relief, we want out of the problem we're in, we're looking for a healing. But Jesus was looking for a resurrection. And at the very end, Jesus' glory would be shown brighter than it ever could have had he healed Lazarus instead of raising him up from the dead. I think the second thing that that jumps off the pages of this chapter is Jesus' grief. You see it in verse number 17. Let's pick our story up there. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, My brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask him. If you had been here, you can almost hear the anxiety in in her voice. Lord, if you just made it in time, you could have just been here. You could have come this way earlier. All this funeral, all this burial could have been prevented. My brother could be alive today if you had been here. I think sometimes those, those words, if only, uh, we've, heard, we've said them a lot ourselves, if only. God, if, if only I hadn't been born into this family, if only my mom and dad hadn't abused me, if, if only I could have been in, born in a Christian home, if only I hadn't married this woman or, or married this man or married somebody else, if only, God, that could, if only I hadn't gotten sick, Lord, and been debilitated, if only, God, if only, and we have all our if onlys lined up, if only this hadn't happened, if only I hadn't met that person, if only I hadn't gone this direction, if only I hadn't gotten sick, if only, if only, God, we just talk with regret about the if onlys in our life. And she looks at her master confused, the one who could make a difference didn't. He stayed back. In fact, he didn't even make it for the funeral. There's something about death I think in all of our lives, it makes us want to accuse God of betrayal. Because we know God has all power and all authority. We know he's the resurrection of life, but, but someone we love dies. But if God is God at any time, he's probably the most active in our lives in our times of loss because he says, yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I face troubles and trials in my way, even though I lose a loved one along the way, I've lost my parents, my wife, one of my brothers, even though those times happen along in our life, I wanna tell you, God is still God and nothing can separate me from his love, uh, neither death, can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And so I am in Christ Jesus. Look at verse number 32, and I want you to notice this. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if, there's that word again, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him, they asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Look at those two words. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And the Jews nailed it. He did love Lazarus. Now, I want to just propose something to you. 
says in verse number four, or verse number two, he said, I think it's verse four, he said, this is, this is happening so that the glory of God might be revealed. This sickness will not end in death. It's not the final word. So he already knows that he is gonna raise Lazarus from the dead. If you know the end of the story, if you know that Lazarus is gonna come walking out of the tomb, why are you gonna cry? Why weep? The reason he does is because Jesus Christ in that moment is identifying with the pain and grief of Martha and Mary and all the other Jews who are gathered around and they are weeping and they are crying. You see, Jesus Christ, he is fully God. He is the I am God, the I am resurrection of life. He is Yahweh, but he is also fully human, and as a fully human, he identifies with my pain and my hurts and my suffering. And when I, he's a, he's a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities and he knows exactly what we are going through. To think that the creator who made me cries with me when I cry. Jesus is there. You see the sympathy, you see the emotion, you see the empathy that he feels for Mary and Martha in that moment. It says in Isaiah 53, prophesying his death, he would die on the cross. That he called him a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And yet Jesus cries not with the same hopelessness that we often cry with through ignorance, but his cry is a cry of compassion. Coming along beside of somebody, standing with them, weeping with them, being present in the moments. No one hates the devastating consequences of sin more than Jesus Christ does. He weeps. And I want to tell you, there is not a sigh, there is not a pain, there is not a tear that escapes his notice. He sees everything that you experience and go through. He knows our sorrows, and so we see Jesus' grief. And it goes back to the reason he grieved, because he loves. He loves. But the third point is simply this, Jesus' power. Let's pick up the story in verse number 23. And it says, and Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again and the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am Yahweh, God, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, though he li will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who has come into the world. Now, this is the fifth I am statement we find in the book of John. Now, Jesus doesn't deny Martha's supposition that yes, he will be raised at the last day. There is a day, I wanna tell you, when the trump of God shall sound and every grave of every single child of God all around the world is gonna open up, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, and we are gonna meet the Lord in the air. How many are looking forward to that trumpet blast? You're waiting for that voice of the archangel. You're waiting for that for the Lord to return and take us home. God is coming back for his church. It's gonna be a reality. But Jesus does something here. He takes her eschatology, he takes her doctrine, and he takes it even a step further and says it is not just about a future resurrection, but I wanna tell you, I am the resurrection in life. I am in your presence right now. I am here to do miracles. I'm here to transform you. I'm here to give you everlasting life. You see, some people think that, that uh, you get everlasting life when you die. Listen, everlasting life begins the moment you invite the I am God into your heart and life. And as soon as he comes in, because he lives inside of you, you now have his resurrection life flowing through you because he's the I am God. The resurrection is not limited to a future event when he returns. It takes place when he enters your heart and life and gives you a brand new life in him. It is, it is a full, abundant life. He says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. It is that full life in Christ Jesus. Martha is looking to the future. I know one day you can raise him from the dead. All the friends who are gathered there are looking back to the past. He, he could have prevented this from happening if, if he'd only gotten here on time. But Jesus is looking at the present eternal right now by declaring, I am the I am God. He is now the resurrection of life. And now he has resurrection power for every single child of God. Wow. 
Martha had faith. She says in verse 22, God will give you whatever you ask. I wanna tell you, to make a statement like that takes great faith. Martha had faith. And then she says in verse number 27, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And so a lot of people ju- kind of jump on Martha because we know the Mary and Martha story from Luke and, 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 and Mary's the one who sits at the feet of Jesus Christ and, and Martha's too busy doing the laundry and the food and cooking and cleaning and all the other stuff that she does. she's just really busy. And Jesus says, Mary hath chosen the better part. But it doesn't mean Martha didn't have great faith because she said, I know, you can do whatever you ask and I, you can do it. And I know that, that you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, but she has what I call a doctrinal faith or a philosophical faith. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, go down a little bit later in that same chapter, verse number 39, Jesus says, roll away the stone. Who's the one who opens their mouth and comments on the stench that's gonna come out of that stone? says, but Lord, by this time, there is a bad odor for he has been dead for four days. So on the one hand, she says, Lord, I know you can do anything, right? Except raise Lazarus from the dead because by now, he already stinks. Like this, this big God can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to, but he just can't do it in my life. There's a difference between doctrinal faith and Practical faith, right? And we see that in her, in her testimony right there. It's a diff- one thing to say God can do it. It's another thing to hear that rhema word of God and say God will, God will. I believe he's in this and we're in this together and God will do this miracle. She's, he says, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is, the, is, is a reality to all those who have their life in Christ Jesus right now. It is not a future event. It is impossible for death to prevail in the presence of the risen Lord. That's why it says in that verse, it says, even though they die, yet shall they live. Why? Because they have resurrection life. So for the child of God, when I die, when my time comes, I just simply, as the word describes it, fall asleep in Christ, and then I awaken and I'm in his presence. So we never leave the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's with me the moment I say, God, come into my life. God, save me. But he's He's in my, I'm in his presence when I die. I go to be with him. Even though he die, yet shall he live. We just simply pass into eternity with Christ. We don't have to wait to the last day to receive that abundant life. We can receive it now because he is life. He is eternal. He is incorruptible. He is transformational. It's all found in a person who is Jesus Christ the resurrection and life. Now, Lazarus had been, uh, the custom was, they would, if someone died, they would wrap their body in linen grave clothes, grave cloths. And they would take and they would anoint the body. And so the ladies would put the anointing oil on the body of Lazarus to try to over in a home. It was all done the same day. You can imagine in that Middle Eastern heat how fast the body could decay or decompose. And so when they come to the stone, And they say, by now he stinketh, in the King James Version. He stinketh, don't roll away the stone right now, he stinks. There was a belief among the rabbis, the rabbinical order of the Jews, that that they believed that, that when someone died, the spirit of that person would remain near the body for three days with seeking a possible re-entry into that body, okay? But notice Jesus Christ delayed his coming, not one day, but two days, because it would be total of a four days by the time he got here. In fact, when the messenger is talking to Jesus Christ, I will tell you, Lazarus had already died by the time the messenger was making his journey to Jesus Christ. So Lazarus is already dead when he hears the news that Lazarus was sick, right? You get the scenario. Four days he waits. The spirit seeing the decaying body, knowing there is no hope, has departed and gone, long gone, and now there is hopeless, it is beyond hope. He'd already raised the widow's son, he'd already of Nain, he'd already raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He's already done some resurrection miracles, but, but nothing after four days. 
But Jesus Christ will go into the spirit realm and bring back the spirit of Lazarus and place that spirit back into that body and he would be raised again after four days being dead. Why? Because he is absolutely the resurrection and the life. Death doesn't have a chance in the presence of Jesus. Wow. The power, the power of Jesus Christ. It has been said, one Puritan writer said this, if he had not caused Lazarus by name, he believed every cemetery in the area might have been opened up and all the dead come walking out. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came out wrapped in those grave clothes because the life entered back into him because he came in contact with the resurrection and the life. In this battle, there's a battle that's going on. There's a warfare going on the entire time. And so Satan is there. He takes Lazarus out, but, but Jesus takes his foot and puts it on the head of the serpent, and he wins an incredible battle, incredible spiritual battle on that day. And the serpent would go slithering off into his old hole somewhere. But he would reemerge again a few months later. The Bible tells us that at the end of this miracle that Jesus Christ retired up to Galilee for a time because the crowd now is growing so massive. People are coming from all over. Bethany being two miles from Jerusalem. John says they came from Jerusalem. They were there at Bethany. This, this raising Lazarus after four days, news spreads everywhere and there's a phenomenal crowd there and it's growing all the time. And so what happens is the high priest, and while many believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were jealous and wanted to kill him. In fact, they caucus all the Sanhedrin together, and the Sanhedrin says, you know what? Uh, and the high priest says, it's better that one man die than the whole nation be destroyed. Now, he didn't realize what he was saying. He was thinking he was saying, this crowd is getting so large that Rome is gonna come in and squash this rebellion. They're all gonna declare he's the Messiah. Everybody's gonna come and follow him and come after him. And we might all lose our life and we'll lose our place in the temple, in the synagogue. It'll all be destroyed. And so it's better that one man die for the nation. But the word of God says he was speaking prophetically because he himself said, if a seed falls into the ground and dies, it comes forth and bears much fruit. And because of Jesus Christ's death, all the nations can be saved today because he gave his life for us on the cross. He didn't know what he was saying, but we know exactly what he meant. It's necessary for one man to die, Jesus to die and take my place that I might be saved and have my sins forgiven. The Bible says after that, they plotted to kill him. And a short time later, they would find him in a garden praying before God, sweating as it were drops of blood. They took him away and they started a series of mock trials. Pilate realizes very early in the trial process that this is an innocent man. And so he, the Bible says he had him beaten with a cat of nine tails. And they took this cat of nine tails and they had rocks, glass at the end of those, each one of those braids, those nine braids. And they would take that whip and they would wrap it around his body and would flay his body and open him right up, his raw flesh and bones being revealed as a Incredible, incredible loss of blood. The crown of thorns placed in his brow. The nails in his hands. He did all that for us. He died in our place. Gave his life for us because he loves us. And, and they would put him on a cross and they put him on the tomb and Satan comes out of his hole and he thinks, I've finally got him now. I've won. He's in the grave. He's in the tomb. And, and that now... The Son of God's gone. But three days later, Jesus Christ would walk out of that grave. Hallelujah. And forever declare and prove again, I am the resurrection and the life. I want to read from John 20, the end of John's account. Look at verse number one. Listen to the Easter story. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples and the one Jesus loved. Aren't you glad the way John describes himself? I'm his favorite. It's kind of interesting he uses that language. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
he bent over and looked into the strips of linen lying there but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, John himself, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. Wow. I, uh, we, we're talking about two resurrections and we're bringing this I am resurrection all into fruition at this Easter season. But there's some differences between the two resurrections. Lazarus himself would, would rise again because Jesus would call him to come forth, but he would die sometime later. We don't know how long Lazarus lived after his own personal resurrection, but there would come a time when he would die again because he would be resurrected to his old body that he'd always had and carried around. But Jesus Christ, he came out with a glorified body. He would never ever die again or face death again because he was, he was ahead as new resurrected, glorious, glorified body, the same kind of body we're gonna have when Jesus Christ comes back to take us home. There's another difference here. The Bible says Lazarus came out bound in his grave clothes. And Jesus tells the crowd who are there, loose him. I think it's a good picture of what the church is to do when anybody comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We come in and help them to grow in Christ and mature in the Lord and we, we work with them. But, and I don't know if they just, one of the guys may have just took that, took that end of that uh, grave cloth and pulled it real quick and sent him spinning around. I don't know how they loosed him, but they got him loose. Not so with Jesus. He just came right out of his grave clothes left him right there on where he had been laid. The tomb that Jesus Christ was in was a borrowed tomb. He only needed it for three days. Lazarus would use his own tomb and would later use that again. And then there was a stone and Jesus told them to roll away the stone. And so with great force, they had to gather around that stone and push it back where Lazarus was. But I would tell you, the stone in front of Jesus Christ's tomb did not need to be rolled away. Why? Because Jesus himself had been glorified. He could walk right through walls. You remember when the the disciples are up there, they're scared for their lives. They're behind locked doors after the resurrection. Bam, right through the wall, right through the door, Jesus shows up because what? He has his brand new glorified body. Why then was the stone rolled away? It wasn't so Jesus Christ could get out. It was so Peter and John could get in. He wanted them to see the place where Jesus Christ had laid. And the Bible says when John saw that, he saw it and believed. When Jesus had his encounter with Mary, he asked Mary, do you believe? Do you believe? And for all of you today, I have that very same question. Do you believe? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here today. Holy Spirit, do your work in this place. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Every head is bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask you the same question today. Do you believe? I've shared the Easter story. I've shared the resurrection story. We've talked about the empty tomb, but do you believe that he died for your sins and rose again the third day? Do you really believe that he loves you? He loves you whatever you're going through, that God loves you and cares about you? Do you believe this? You see, the only way to have that resurrection life inside of you is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Romans 10 that to as many as believe on him and confess with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. The only way to receive his resurrection life is to say, God, I believe in you. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Live inside of me. Take all of my sins away. And when you pray a simple prayer like that, the Lord comes in. You have that resurrection life today. Hallelujah. If you're here today and would say, Pastor, just pray for me. I, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ this morning. I'm ready to receive him as my Lord and Savior. I, I just want to pray for you. We're gonna pray for you this morning. Just slip your hand up right now and say, I need the Lord. I'm ready to receive him. I believe on him. Ready to invite him to come in. Yes, God bless you, sir. There's somebody else in the balcony, anybody else that say, pray for me. I wanna invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart, come into my life. Just say, I 
I need the Lord today. Lift your hand up right now all over this building. Don't want to miss anybody. Say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Yes, God bless you, sir. You may slip your hand down. If there's somebody else, you'd say, pray for me. Just wave at me, acknowledge. Yes, God bless you, young man. Is there somebody else? You'd say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus Christ today. Yes, God bless you. You may slip your hand down. Yes, sir. God bless you. Is there somebody else? Say, I'm ready to receive Jesus into my heart and into my life. Yes, sir. God bless you. You may slip your hand down. Anyone else? Yes, in the balcony. God bless you. Hallelujah. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Anyone else? Holy Spirit's ministering. He's speaking to people today. Anybody else? I've already told you how we're saved. I think when you raised your hand, you're acknowledging your need of God and you're expressing your belief in Him. I may have not seen every hand, but that doesn't matter. God not just sees the hand, but He sees your heart. He's what your heart's cry is. He's already seen that. It says we need to confess it with our mouths. So what we're going to do is help you this morning. I'm going to ask the whole church to pray together. We don't want anybody at Faith Church to pray alone. And so I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of confession of faith in His Lordship. And I'd just like you to repeat it after me. And we're going to be seven or eight people going to pray that for the very first time today. Let's help them out together. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me so much. I believe you came to this earth to save me. I thank you you died on the cross. And there you took my place. I don't have to face the judgment of God, but can receive all the mercy of God. I thank you that that blood's powerful to take all my sins away. I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to take my sins away right now. And I believe you're alive today and that you can come and live inside of me. So come now, be my Lord and my Savior. And with your help, from this day forward, I'm gonna follow and serve you Thank you now for saving me. Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for all those who asked Jesus Christ to come into their life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices when, when someone who is lost comes to find the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a celebration going on in heaven, and we're celebrating with you Right now, today, if you invited Jesus Christ to come to your heart and life, we're going to be baptizing brand new believers in water. Next Sunday morning, you can be a part of that. Let's all stand together if we would. Please, no one leaving just right now. I'm going to open up these altars and invite our prayer team to come. We've got a prayer team here, and if you invited Christ to come into your life, I just encourage you to come down and meet one of these brothers or sisters. If you don't have a Bible, they'll make sure that you get one. And uh, they will pray with you this morning and, uh, and tell you what some good next steps to take as you grow and start this new journey of following the Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I, just, I just felt the Lord drop something in my heart. I think some of you in the room may be in that space between. You're in the space between Lazarus dying, Lazarus being resurrected. You're in that, that four-day span of, Lord, where are you? I don't understand what's going on in my life. Why am I suffering? Why am I going through this trial, this test, whatever it may be? Sometimes it's good. That's why the body of Christ is so important. That's why we need each other in the family of God. And so one of the things we like to do is pray for one another. If you need prayer today for healing in your body, they'll follow the word of God and they'll anoint you with oil and believe that that prayer of faith will heal your body today. If you're going through a trial and a test, a relational problem, a financial problem, whatever it may be, they're here to pray with you today. We don't wanna let this service go and dismiss everybody until you've had an opportunity to be prayed for this morning. So whatever you have need of, if you're in that space between the, 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 the seeming silence of God and the answer to your miracle. We're gonna believe today that God can do it. Amen, amen. Let me pray for all of you one more time and ask God to bless you. Thank you, God.
Thank you, God, for your presence today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for those who surrender their heart and life to you. And I pray for some that may even be hurting here today. Minister grace and life and strength, we pray. In Jesus' name. Now, if you need to come, you can make your way down or any time in just a moment. Let me once again thank all of you for being here. It is so good to have you. I want to wish you again the happiest of Easter's. Just give you a reminder that here in Faith Somerville, we're starting our three-service schedule. So this schedule you're used to today at 8.30 and 10 o'clock and 11.30 will continue now for about the next six or seven months. Let me tell you why that is the case. Because we're going to remodel this whole sanctuary. We're going to re-expand the foyer. And we got to get out of here in about three or four weeks. Already I got someone picking up 12 more pews this week. Someone else getting 20 pews the week after that. And so our seating is beginning to diminish as we are in the process of clearing out the auditorium. But it's going to be an exciting time when we celebrate together. And then we're all going to come back in hopefully before Christmas and have just a grand glorious time in our newly remodeled sanctuary over these next six months. So this will be our service time from here on out. We would just want to like to say every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday at Faith Church because Jesus Christ is alive and he's risen and we need one another in the family of God. So thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. If you're a guest, stop by at the Connection Center. We'd like to get to know you better and give us some information. We have a gift for you if you like it. Take a look at the screen for just a moment as we say goodbye today. On behalf of everyone here at Faith, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you were blessed by the proclamation of God's Word. I want to take a moment and speak directly to anyone who is feeling led to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. I know you may be battling some doubt, some uncertainty in regards to this decision. But that tug you are feeling is God beckoning you toward Him, calling you by name. His death and resurrection opened the only path that can bring you into right relationship with God. And regardless of where you have been or what you have done, He will forgive you of all of your sins and transform every area of your life as you seek Him with a whole heart. Making Jesus your Lord and Savior starts with first repenting of your old way of life and abandoning it completely so that He can show you all that you were purposed for and meant to do with Him and through Him. If you are ready to make this decision, I want you to simply repeat this statement after me. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died and were resurrected on the third day. I ask that you please forgive me for my sins and come and be the Lord and Savior of my life. From this day forward, I commit my life to you and I ask that you guide me by your hand and correct me when I go astray. I love you and will obey you. Amen. To all who just said that prayer, I want to congratulate you on making the single most important decision of your life. And we here at Faith are rejoicing with you, along with all of heaven. If I can encourage you, please head over to faithishere.org slash salvation for important next steps on your journey with Christ. Since September of 2020, over 87 people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior online. And this would not have been possible without your generous giving. If you're interested in supporting our online ministry, head over to faithishere.org slash give for a variety of giving options. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay connected with everything the Lord is doing through Faith Church. We sincerely hope you have a fantastic rest of your week and may you experience the love of Jesus more powerfully every moment of every day. Amen.